Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. This cast is on tannins, and while I've mentioned them in lots of other casts, I haven't worried too much about details, mostly because it's possible to go a pretty long way in talking about wine with just a nutshell definition of tannins. They're compounds in wines that have an astringent or mouth-drying effect on the palate and that also contribute other characteristics to the experience of drinking wine, as well as contributing to the ageability of wine. If you know that, you'll be able to stay afloat in a conversation, but to take things to a better understanding, we'll have to go all the way down and start at the molecular level. Tannins belong to a class of chemical compounds called polyphenols that are based on the phenol molecule, which is itself based on a benzene molecule of six carbon and six hydrogen atoms in a ring shape joined to a hydroxyl group or an oxygen and hydrogen molecule attached to the benzene ring with a bond formed by swapping out one of the original six hydrogen atoms in the benzene for the hydrogen atom in the hydroxyl group. What makes phenols interesting is that they like to bond with things and can hook up with other whole phenols or with lone hydroxyl groups to form more complex molecules called polyphenols. There are thousands of phenolic compounds that occur naturally, and what they share, to oversimplify a bit, is a serious inclination to bond with other compounds and chemicals, and, again to oversimplify, tannins are just a subset of these polyphenols that like to bond specifically to proteins, as well as some other organic compounds, and then precipitate them or cause them to fall out of the solution that they're in. Tannins are found in plants throughout the world, but the ones that make it into wine get there either during the maceration and fermentation stages of winemaking from the skins, seeds, and stems of grapes and belong to a group of tannins called condensed or non-hydrolyzable tannins. Or they make their way into wine from barrels made of oak or other wood that the wine is aged in. These wood or barrel tannins, as they're sometimes called, are known as hydrolyzable tannins. If they're there at all, since some wines don't receive oak treatments, wood tannins are much less prominent in wine than grape tannins are, contributing only about 6 to 12 percent as much tannin as do grapes, and making up maybe 5 to 10 percent of the total tannins in an oak-treated wine. Because most of the tannins in wine come from parts of the grape, and because they enter the wine via maceration or skin contact, any discussion about tannins in wine, with a few exceptions that we'll mention later, is really a discussion about tannins and red wine. Because of the extended contact between juice, seeds, skins, and sometimes stems that makes up the red wine making process. White wines can have a little tannin, especially if there's been limited skin and juice contact before pressing and if they've undergone a regimen of oak. But even a white that was treated very aggressively with oak, think of the oakiest California shard you can, won't have the same mouth-puckering astringency that a young tannic red will. Speaking of astringency, this is probably the most famous characteristic associated with tannins, followed perhaps by bitterness. Why tannins are experienced this way is a little complicated, and it bears getting technical again, so stick with me. Individual molecules of condensed tannins, remember that those are the most common ones, the ones from grapes, called monomers, like to bind with other identical molecules into longer and shorter molecular chains, called polymers. These polymer chains can be longer or shorter, and their length is measured as degree of polymerization, or DP referring to the number of monomers in the polymer chain. The longer molecules, that is the ones with higher DP, will be perceived as more astringent or mouth-drying, while smaller or lower DP molecules will be perceived as more bitter. The feeling of astringency comes from the tannin's ability to bond with proteins and amino acids in saliva and then precipitate them out of solution. These proteins provide the feeling of body that saliva has and enable saliva to lubricate the inside of the mouth effectively. By pulling them out of the saliva, the tannins in wine leave the mouth feeling dry and rough, even though there's still lots of moisture left in the mouth. And where do these precipitated proteins go? Most of the time you swallow them, but if you've ever used a spit cup or bucket, say during wine evaluation, you'll be all too familiar with them as that unsightly glob that floats on top of the wine you just spit out. The bitterness, by contrast, comes from the interaction that tannin molecules have with taste receptors on your tongue, with smaller, lower DP molecules being better suited to registering on those receptors than larger ones. As far as is known so far, the tannins that come from the skins of grapes tend to form longer, more astringent, higher DP chains, while seed tannins tend to form shorter, more bitter, lower DP chains. 
Also, there are several different kinds of the condensed tannins that are involved in all of these reactions, each bonding to and incorporating other molecules into their chain that might also affect the perception of both astringency and bitterness. So the actual picture is really much more complex than I'm presenting here. And speaking of complexity, it's worth noting that other factors besides the chemical structure of the tannins seem to affect both bitterness and astringency, with lower pH or higher acid in wine increasing the feeling of astringency, while higher alcohol will create the impression of less astringency but more bitterness. And finally, polysaccharides or certain carbohydrates that are found in wines, including the manoproteins that can result from lees aging, can also lower astringency. That's a lot of information, even if oversimplified, but the big takeaway is that tannins bring both astringency and bitterness to the experience of wine, but astringency is by far the bigger deal, and other factors in wine can contribute to the perception of those two characteristics. As I mentioned a minute ago, there are several different kinds of tannin in wine, so it's not surprising that tannins are often described with different sensory properties, particularly texture properties. Hang around wine people long enough, especially those who evaluate wine as part of their livelihood, and you'll hear about firm, dusty, grippy, chewy, silky, velvety, round, grainy, coarse, smooth, and all sorts of other tannins. Despite the fact that describing tannins as having different textures is a common practice among wine tasters, these different descriptions haven't by and large been correlated to the chemical structures of different tannins, so it's still not clear what's going on with them. Do different tannins really have a different mouthfeel from each other? Or are other factors in the wine like acid, alcohol, or other phenolic compounds, say, affecting the impression that the tannins are making on tasters? Or are these distinctions more in the taster's head than actually in the bottle, or is something else going on? There is some evidence of a correlation between seed tannins and a coarse or rough texture, but further research needs to be done. Whatever the final judgment ends up being on where these textual perceptions are coming from, they certainly do add a layer of complexity to the experience of drinking a wine, as does the tendency of tannin to moderate the perception of fruit in a wine, giving a wine some earthy and savory qualities that act as a foil to excessive fruit expression. In fact, if you've ever heard a wine described as a fruit bomb, one of the things that the person using that phrase is probably trying to express is that the wine lacks tannin to rein in its big fruit character. As a quick side note, you may also hear wine tasters say that they can distinguish between grape and wood tannins in a wine that's received in oak treatment. You might hear somebody say that they can feel grape tannins in one part of the mouth and wood tannins in another part, for example. But there isn't much evidence that these different kinds of tannins can be distinguished by mouthfeel or any other metric, and some very accomplished tasters will have none of it with, for example, Jeff Kruth, master sommelier and certainly someone who knows his way around tannins, saying that he's never found making a distinction between the two of them to be either, quote, reliable or useful. Apart from the sensory characteristics that tannins impart to wine, maybe the most important thing that tannins are connected to is wine aging. Before talking about this issue in any detail, though, it's very important to note that what happens as a wine ages is not well understood at all. This isn't a big surprise, since wines usually do most of their aging in a sealed bottle, and it's really difficult to observe what's going on in the bottle, especially at the level of molecular chemistry. The usual way that red wine aging is explained goes something like this. A good, age-worthy red wine is one that has a good amount of acid, a strong flavor and aroma profile driven mostly by fruit, and a solid core of tannins. Over time, the fruit character of the flavor and aroma profile will change and develop, resulting in a smoother, richer, and better integrated set of flavors, along with the development of additional complex fruit flavors and often savory characteristics as well. While this is happening, it's the job, so to speak, of both the acids and the tannins to act as preservatives and keep the wine in good order as it develops. With time, the acidity of the wine will decrease, and the tannins that love to bind themselves to things, including each other, and form long molecular chains will eventually form molecules so long and large that they can't remain in solution, and will drop out as a deposit or sediment, you know, the schmutz that you find at the bottom of a decanter or in an old bottle of red. Something like this may in fact be happening, at least part of the time, but this doesn't seem to be a good universal explanation for red wine aging if only because there are lots of examples of big tannic reds that age very well without throwing off much in the way of sediment. 
And one possibility to explain this is that while in some cases tannins are getting longer and dropping out, in others the tannins may be forming, breaking, and reforming new bonds, and as this process of combination and recombination goes on, it may be mellowing them out without requiring them to fall out of solution. Tannins do act as antioxidants and protect wine from the harmful effects of oxygen by binding with it and then perhaps releasing it back into the wine during bottle aging or as oxygen levels decrease. This binding with oxygen seems to have a softening effect on the tannins, though no one is sure exactly what molecular mechanism is achieving this. So the takeaway here is that while it seems pretty clear that tannins have something to do with the age worthiness of a wine, as well as the fact that they smooth out and mellow out over time, and that oxygen seems to have something to do with all of this, there's still a lot to be learned about what exactly is going on. And remember that there are low tannin red wines, like Pinot Noir for example, that can age very well, so whatever tannins are doing, they aren't the whole story. I always like to end these casts on a practical note, especially when it's been a very technical cast, and what could be more practical than helping you sort out how likely you are to experience tannins in the wines that you're buying. Since grapes will be the primary source of tannins in your red wine, go in armed with the knowledge that the most tannic wines will be from grapes that have smaller berries, yielding a higher skin-to-juice ratio in the fermenting must. There are a number of grapes that fit this bill, with the most famous ones being Cabernet Sauvignon, Nebbiolo, Syrah, and Tanat. There are lots of other grapes like these, though. Too many here to list, in fact, but a handy cheat in terms of identifying some of them is to be on the lookout for grapes that have some form of petit or petite in their names, like Petit Verdot or Petit Syrah, suggesting that the varietal in question has small berries and thus lots of skin to pulp. How the grape is treated in the vineyard and in the winery will also have an impact on the tannic quality of the final wine, with, for example, grapes that are harvested relatively early without having reached full phenolic or flavor ripeness, making wines with sharper, greener tannins rather than more ripe grapes. But riper grapes will tend to make more alcoholic wines, and the additional alcohol will lower the perception of astringency. In the winery, a long maceration, especially post-fermentation, will boost the tannic quality of a red, not just in terms of overall tannins, but seed tannins that really need alcohol to dissolve into the must and that are more bitter and coarse than skin tannins, will be overrepresented relative to a wine that underwent a shorter maceration. These techniques vary from winemaker to winemaker and won't necessarily be obvious from a label, so it pays to do some research. But certain wine-producing regions, especially in the Old World, are known for techniques that promote tannins, like the long macerations of many Bordeaux, or for techniques that reduce tannins, like semi-carbonic maceration in Beaujolais and elsewhere. If you're interested in trying more wines made from hybrid grapes like you'll find on the east coast of the United States, know in advance that wines made from hybrids tend to have noticeably less tannin than vinifera wines. Not apparently because there are a lot less tannins in the grapes, but because proteins in the pulp and cell walls of hybrid grapes bind to tannins and inhibit their extraction. If you're curious about tannins in white wine, see if you can find an orange wine, that is, white wine made with extended skin and juice contact, like a red wine would be. White grapes have skin and seed tannins just like red grapes do, and it's only the relative lack of skin contact that keeps them out of whites. How tannic an orange wine will be, though, will depend on the producer and the techniques she used, like more or less aggressive pressing and cap management, for example. And don't expect as much of a tannic quality as you'd find in the big reds, since the general wisdom is that tannins don't benefit the sensory profile of white wines as much as they do red wines, so producers of orange wines will often use a light touch when doing things that might extract tannins. Finally, don't assume that the darker a red wine is, the more tannic it is. Reds get their color from polyphenols called anthocyanins that aren't tannins. So there's no direct relationship between tannin content and pigment. But, and this is an important but, tannins do bind to anthocyanins and then act as antioxidants, keeping oxygen from binding to the anthocyanins and bleaching them. So wines with higher tannins will tend to retain darker pigmentation longer than less tannic wines. But the pigmentation itself isn't dependent on tannin content, and the wine world is, sadly, filled with big, dark, inky, red, fruit bomb wines with barely a tannin to their name, while at the other end of the spectrum, Nebbiolo is famous for being a medium-colored red with tannins that'll wipe the floor with you. 
Thanks for joining me for another Winecast. We covered a lot of ground, some of it pretty technical, so thanks for sticking with me. And hopefully it left you with a better sense of what tannins do and how they do it, but also with an understanding that there's still quite a bit to be learned. Before I sign off, I just want to take a second and thank all of my subscribers for helping this channel reach an important milestone, the 1,000 subscriber mark. I'm really fortunate to have subscribers that reach out to me via comments and messages and help me make this channel better with their feedback, so thanks to all of you folks. You're the reason I do this stuff every week. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.